Good morning, viewers. You're now watching Newsroom with me, your anchor, Kekrizanyo Solo. The Supreme Court recently decided to stop criminal cases against Indian Army soldiers involved in the Oting massacre, while 14 civilians were killed in the Oting village on December 4, 2021. This decision has upset many people in the Naga communities, leading to strong reactions from groups like NSCNIM, Naga Hoho, and the Naga Students' Federation. They are expressing their anger and disappointment, calling the soldiers' actions a serious crime. In India, certain military personnel can only be prosecuted with special permission from the government. By denying this permission, the center has effectively protected these soldiers from facing criminal charges in this case. This decision often leads to debates about accountability and justice for victims of such incidents. We will now be discussing on this issue. We will be joined by our Associate Editor, Al Muli. Hello, Al, am I audible? Yes, you uh, are. Al, thank you for joining us today to discuss on this issue. So, first of all, uh, there have been several incidents in India involving allegations of human rights violation by the military under the armed, uh, the AFSPA. One notable case is the 2010 March Hill fake encounter case in Jammu and Kashmir, where security forces were accused of killing three civilians and labeling them as militants. So, comparing the past incidents and the uh, outing incident which happened in 2021, what are your take on the Supreme Court's decision? Uh, I think whatever happened in outing in 2021 was something that would go into the areas of the law where the judiciary cannot really help the people in this regard. Now, the reason is this is not the first time that the Indian military has committed excesses. It has been going on for many years. For the case for, for Naglin, there have been cases all the way going to 1960s, 1970s. Manipur has numerous of them. It is impossible for us to go through them one by one. Manipur, even as I'm during the height of the insurgency, during the time the Alpha was in control of the, the fear system in Assam, and it has been going on in Nagaland. The outing incident, as unfortunate as it was, it was just one of many such excesses, fake encounters, extrajudicial killings. The same is with Jammu and Kashmir. Now, the reason these excesses, they, o they overpass the hands of the law is because the Armed Forces Special Powers Act is still in place. Whether you like it or not, it is still law that is written in black and white. So as much as we would like to contend with the merits and the demerits of certain cases of uh, extrajudicial actions by central agencies, security forces, we cannot do much, the judiciary cannot do much in, the, in this regard that it is written right there in the law. The law of the land says that the military, the military are protected from any action that they take against people who are or are perceived to be insurgents or our sessionist groups that stand in opposition to the constitution of India, that stands in opposition to the country as a sovereign nation. So it is right there written in the law. That is why over the past 60 to 70 years and over the many decades of insurgencies in Jammu and Kashmir, in Manipur, even till the early 1990s, and even in Naglin, Till today, till December 2021, what happened in Mon District, they are all representatives of what the Constitution of India itself sanctions. And that is why we cannot do much in this regard. The judiciary, even the judiciary is confined in a space that they cannot do maneuvering that much, no matter how much we discuss the merits and the demerits of the case. All right, uh, Al, another, I'd like to point out another significant incident in the 2000 killing of 10 civilians in Malom, Manipur, as you've also mentioned Manipur just now, by the Assam Rifles. The incident sparked widespread protests and uh, it called for the repeal of AFSPA. So, 
these cases often highlight issues of accountability and the complexity surrounding military operations in conflict zones. So the question is, how does AFSPA ensure accountability for human rights violation? Uh, there is nothing in the Armed Forces Special Powers Act that says the military, the military people will be held accountable. There is nothing there in the law, the black law, that says if, if you do this, if you kill innocent people, if you walk into someone else's house and arrest them without warrant, if you shoot them just because you thought they were members of the Alpha or the NSCN or the ISIS, whatever, there is nothing in the law that says you're going to court, you're going to face penalty. This is your persecution. And that is why the, all these things are happening. It's quite a draconian implementation in uh, in, also in a state like Nagaland and regarding the p past incidents that has happened so given the allegations of abuse under AFSPA let's say what mechanisms are in place to hold personal accountable for actions that result in civilian harm there is nothing I think there have been very rare because I, I call it rare because I've never ever read about or heard about uh, Indian military personnel being held accountable for actions that were taken under the pretext of the covering of the ASPA anywhere, especially in anti-insurgency operations and activities in the Northeast region. I don't think, and like I said before, it's actually the law that grants impunity, that grants some kind of a protection to Indian military personnel to be able to presently take the kind of extrajudicial actions they take. And what happened in Oting, you mentioned Mavam in Manipur, and a lot of them in Kashmir most of the time. And I think Kashmir is a place where we hear a lot about fake encounters all the time. So it's actually the law that is sanctioning this. So Al, is, is in this case, is AFSPA still necessary in current conflict zones? I know this is quite a controversial question. But considering the history of abuses and the changing nature of conflict in regions like, as you've just mentioned, Jammu and Kashmir and the Northeast, if, is AFSPA an effective tool for maintaining security or does it exacerbate tensions? Because times have changed over the past, let's say, 30 years, times have changed. So is it still relevant here in our state? Objectively, objectively speaking, yes, uh, times have changed, but value system, they don't change. The violence that was perpetuated in 2000 BC and the violence that was perpetuated in 150 BC is still the kind of human nature that perpetuates the violence that we are seeing in the 21st century. So the value systems are still in place as it were 25,000 years ago. So that is why, objectively speaking, we need laws. We need some kind of an overarching administrative hand that keeps in check the actions of the citizens of a constitutional society, of a governmental society, of a state that has some kind of a political foundation for them to be able to call themselves a nation and a people. So, like I said, objectively, yes, uh, technically insurgencies are still going on in most of the northeastern states. Manipur is there. We have Nagaland. We have Tripura. And even in Jammu and Kashmir. And then in central India, we have the Nagzalites and the Maoist insurgencies. So technically, the government of India or the authorities, they needed some kind of a mechanism for them to be able to encounter these, uh, these problems with some kind of a legal mechanism. So that is why they, I think that was the reason why they had to implement an entirely militarized legislation that such as the one we have now uh, called the AFSPA to be able to counter these threats. So it is not so much about if times have changed or not. It is not so much about our perception of what violence is, what not violence is, and what political violence is, and what violence against the citizens and the public are. 
So the differentiation is not so much as that. It is entirely to have some kind of a military to military mechanism for them to be able to meet the threats effectively. And that is why we have the AFSPA here, technically speaking, because when it comes to political violence, then this kind of violence cannot be met by normal, ordinary criminal or civil laws. They can be met only by military laws. And so technically, the ASPA is in place. All right, El, uh, how, how, how effective are the central government and the Supreme Court in addressing and preventing human rights violations committed under AFSPA? And what accountability mechanisms are in place for victims? It sounds very similar to the previous question, but the thing is, we're involving the government directly and the Supreme Court right now. So what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think right now, talking of accountability, as much as the state government or the central government can do is to sanction some kind of an aggression to the victims. It's just a small handkerchief uh, that we are giving them to wipe away the tears of ocean, if I may put it. It is it's not even a consolation, but that is all that we can do for the victims. And we have had a... Uh, Supreme Court decide on this case and they have thrown out the case because they can't do much in this regard but uh, we, talk, we talked of accountability mechanisms we have also talked about that they can't do much because these kind of actions are all sanctioned by the AFSPA itself by the law itself so there's no much scope for space for even the judiciary and even for the people to be moving around in this regard so I think uh, right now uh, that a case has been decided by the Supreme Court that it is not permissible or they cannot persecute those uh, 30 Indian Army um, soldiers uh, and hold them accountable for what happened in Mon. Now we cannot do much but there's still a little bit of um, leeway for the people. I talked to my uncle who is a lawyer and we are not really qualified to be talking about some of the legal, uh, complex legal uh, aspects of this case. But I had a conversation with him and this is what he said. While there are no mechanisms to hold these people accountable, there are a number of, how should I put it, options or maybe two particular options that the people can pursue now. And although it's not as big as uh, the Supreme Court itself persecuting those, prosecuting those people who had a hand in the Otin case. So these are the two uh, uh, options that the people have been left now. First, my uncle says that we can file a writ petition in the Supreme Court asking or requesting the Supreme Court to set up a constitutional bench to allow a petition where they again uh, d uh, try this case but it also depends whether the chief justice of india will allow this petition to set up a constitutional bench now what is a constitutional bench a constitutional bench is not so much about trying certain criminal or civil um, uh, acts um, cr criminal acts but they are more to do with interpretation of the law so there are maybe what he was saying is that they will sit, the bench will sit and they will interpret how, uh, the, the various aspects of the ASPA and how it falls within the ambit of uh, a certain act, ambit of certain acts that might sanction some kind of a criminal action against those who were responsible for the Mon massacre. So that is one. And second, it seems that the other option that we can pursue is go to the central government. The state government or the aggrieved party can approach the central government and through the central government seek a prosecution order against pe the people, the military personnel who were involved in the Moting case. So if the central government says or issues a sanction that says prosecute them, 
that it becomes a special, it, it becomes an exception for the judiciary to prosecute them because the one who wrote the law is the one who is saying take, against, t take action against the lawbreakers. So I think those are the only two options left for now. All right, Al. Uh, another question that I'd like to ask you is, AFSPA has been lifted in certain areas over time, uh, say notably Meghalaya. AFSPA was removed in 2018 after improvements in the security situation. And so there are certain districts of Assam where AFSPA was revoked in specific district based on local conditions. So do you think at any point Nagaland would is uh, like would AFSPA be repealed from Nagaland at any point of time, like any 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 soon, any time soon, especially after such an incident that happened in 2021? Yeah, I think the government of Nagaland in 2022 and 2023 had said something in regard to lifting the AFSPA from entire Nagaland, but unfortunately, it was stated that the sanction was that the AFSPA would be lifted in only certain districts of the state. So it is partial, not entire. But then again, um, objectively, uh, the AFSPA is not in place in Naglin. It's not in place in Naglin, not because there's shooting going on every day. There are people dying. It is in place because there is insurgency, whether there is violence or not. Non-state actors are still active in Naglin. How, how they are working, I think we see it every day. And what they are doing, we see it every day. It might be not in the form of wars and bombings and assassinations, but they are active still and insurgency is still in place. And that is the reason why the AFSPA is still in uh, is still in Naglen. In regard to Meghalaya too, of course, I think the Garo National Liberation Army um, had troubled Meghalaya for decades and decades and there were reports recently that the GNLA would be regrouping. I don't know where I read but there were concerns in the government circles in Meghalaya in regard to the potential emergence of militancy in Meghalaya. But still then, insurgency in Meghalaya is not as active as it is in Manipur or Naglen. So, um, like I said before, it is the AFSPA is an overarching uh, military mechanism for them to keep a check on a particular jurisdiction of the country that has insurgency activities. Many people say that oh, we don't have bombings like they do in Manipur, we don't have assassinations all the time, we don't have people out there with guns fighting in the streets, so there is peace. So we don't need the AFSPA, but it is not that. There is a mechanism that would like to keep an eye on the situation on the ground, on the insurgency, insurgency culture. So that is why the AFSPA is in place. And as far as Nagaland is con concerned, I think since 2022, like, uh, like I mentioned earlier, since 2022 and 2023, especially in the onset of the Nagaland State Assembly elections, there were a lot of promises that maybe, or at least the impression was given that the AFSPA would be repealed from the state of Nagaland. But as it stands now, uh, it will be in place because, like I said, we have a lot of extra state actors. We, had, we have a lot of parallel governments in Nagaland that is still working and active. So it will be in place for some time. All right, El, uh, when we talk about AFSPA, the prime reason AFSPA exists is to maintain law and order Oh, no, it's, it's not so much about law and order. Um, the Home Ministry takes care of all the law and order jurisdictions in the country. But it is the Defence Ministry that, take care, that takes care of the military, the Indian military. But in this regard, the AFSPA, of course, it sounds like a, like a law and order mechanism, but it's not for thieves and murderers and rapists. It is only for people 
extrajudicial, uh, extrajudicial actors or non-state actors, people who run parallel governments to a constitutionally set up in, uh, political institution like the government of Nagaland or the legislative assembly, people who stand in opposition against the constitutional institution of the state or the center. So the AFSPA is not so much about law and order. It, it has nothing to do with the law and order. The law and order uh, subjects of a state, they are all taken care of by the home affairs of by the home department in Nagaland, by the police, the deputy commissioners, they are the one taking in charge. But as for the AFSPA, it is solely to do with national security elements of law enforcement, such as insurgency, milit militancy, or even terrorism. Uh, uh, right, El, very true. But uh, AFSPA was seen as a means to manage the security challenges posed by ongoing militancy and unrest in the region. So, like, how would you justify if there is any justification that there was the, the one of the incidents that I can clearly remember that disturbed let's just say Nagaland as a whole was in 2017 because of the ULB elections and then in 2021 was the Otting incident but in between that we have faced say common minor common crimes but those have never traumatize our people like how the Otting incident has traumatized us in general. So how would you, if there is like I said any justification, the Supreme Court's decision on this and you've previously mentioned about the petition and there are ways that we can proceed with asking for justice for the Otting incident. So in conclusion, specifically are what are our options that uh, is there any options that's open to us for us uh, as i've mentioned oh, earlier i think the only option for us is to go to the central government of course represented by uh, the legal fraternity and approach the government of india for a prosecu pros prosecution sanction so that the the state the law mechanism can take a, a, a action against those indian military personnel who kill those people in Mon district. This is the first option. Second is to approach the uh, Supreme Court of India to set up a constitutional bench uh, so that they can review the act and try to interpret it in such a way that there is a level of accountability that is tacked on those people who murdered uh, the innocents in Mon district. So these are the only two options for now, but it will be interesting to see what the state government of Nagaland or the aggrieved parties in Nagaland would do in this regard so they can secure justice for those innocents who died in Otting in 2021. All right, El, thank you. We'll wrap it up from here, but before we do so, is there any other point you'd like to add? Uh, certainly not now, but I would like to consult with my uncle and some of my friends in the legal fraternity, uh, legal community and we can engage in this conversation la la later on. All right, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. There was El Muli, our associate editor. He joined us to discuss on this issue. In, on December 4, 2021, in Otting Nagalim, the Indian army killed 14 innocent Naga civilians, mistakenly believing they were militants. Despite a ceasefire in place since 1997, this incident is seen as a severe violation of human rights and has angered Naga communities. So far, there has been a decision from the Supreme Court and people, the people of Nagaland are not so happy with the decision. As we get more updates, we'll keep updating you. For that, keep watching Hornbill TV.